And I'm Marav Fine, the Program Manager for Member Services at the Jewish Funders Network, and I'm joined by Ellen Israelson of the Jewish Communal Fund and also Scott Shea. Um, they're going to be speaking with us today about donor advised funds, how they work, um, what's, what's great about them, how they have changed ways of giving, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you've just called in, you have, you have been muted, and also this call is being recorded. At JFN, we're really committed to our Jewish value set. We think that understanding how we give improves the way that we're able to fix the world, um, and it improves our ability to be as inclusive as possible in our giving. So we're really excited to learn more about this. And so without further ado, I'll hand it off to Ellen um, to teach us okay. about donor advice funds. Thank you, and uh, our thanks to Jewish Funders Network for giving us this opportunity. Um, we are looking forward to working with uh, Jewish funders on many different projects. There's a lot of synergies between, I think, our two memberships. And we're happy to give some information about donor advised funds, which are, in fact, the fastest growing charitable vehicle at this point in time. And in the presentation, I'll get into a lot of the reasons why people tend to be looking at, at donor advised funds uh, rather than other vehicles for their philanthropy. I first just wanted to say uh, a couple of things about Jewish Communal Fund for people who aren't as familiar with us. We were one of the first donor advised funds. We've been around for 43 years. We're the largest Jewish donor advised fund. We manage uh, close to $1.4 billion in assets, and that represents 3,200 funds. And uh, one of the things that uh, makes us a Jewish donor advised fund, because our, our clients, our donors, can give to whatever public charities they desire. Uh, they can be sectarian or non-sectarian. But the idea is that by giving through a communal vehicle, you can leverage additional support for the Jewish community. So each year, Jewish Communal Fund makes a community gift to UJA Federation here in New York to support organizations that, that serve the Jewish community and the greater community. So by giving together as a community and allowing a donor advised fund, a, a Jewishly affiliated donor advised fund to facilitate, we are leveraging that impact in, and we are able to reinvest in the community. Um, Jewish Communal Fund is a little bit different than other Jew Jewish donor advised funds out there uh, because we are independent. We have our own board of trustees, um, and we do support our federation here, but we are not part of our federation. That makes us just a little bit different model than, than many other Jewish donor advised funds that might be part and parcel of either their Jewish community foundation or their federation. Uh, just wanted to say a little bit about the impact because that's another important factor in determining how you want to do your giving. Um, Again, because people are giving together with Jewish Communal Fund, the fees that are charged for the facilitation of their philanthropy do get reinvested in the community. As I mentioned, we do the $2 million gift to UJA Federation every year. Well over $10 million has been awarded from our Special Gifts Fund, which is like our endowment to dozens of Jewish communal organizations. And those grants range from uh, helping to supply housing for uh, elderly Holocaust survivors, to kosher food pantries, uh, to supporting Jewish camping. So we're able to touch many different segments of the Jewish community and offer this support. Uh, in terms of the flow of dollars that go out from Jewish Communal Fund, on average we're sending $300 million a year to thousands of charities, and that's in every single sector. Uh, so, donor advised funds, how do they work? Uh, basically, 
the donor advised fund is a great alternative to tracking your own and managing your own charity, and it is even an alternative to a private foundation. Basically, there is a public charity, not a, not a private charity, a public charity, that would be us in this case, that supports these funds. The donor makes it an irrevocable gift. They get the tax deduction at the time they make the gift. Segregated accounts are made, so everything is tracked separately. And then the donors get to the privilege of recommending grants to the charities of their choice. And the donor advised fund is really handling all of the work. Um, I just wanted to give you a couple quick statistics before we get into more of the aspects of, of how it works and what the advantages are depending on your philanthropy. Um, in the 2014 Donor Advised Fund Report, uh, uh, donor advised assets grew nearly 20% to a just under $24 billion. This is from the National Philanthropic Trust. The grants in 2014 from do, the, all donor advised funds in the aggregate was $9.6 billion and uh, 217,000 accounts are now created um, in the U.S. And the contributions to donor advised funds totaled uh, a little over $17 billion. So it's it's really caught on, and it's probably the most flexible vehicle out there. I'm not going to get into this legal definition, but why, why are these donor advice funds so popular? It's basically because they make charitable giving very easy and very organized. Once you give a contribution in to establish a fund, the only receipts you have to worry about are when you make an initial contribution or when you replenish your fund. You don't worry about tracking receipts. You don't worry about the record keeping. You don't have to check to see if your charities are still up to date with the IRS, and you don't have to worry about checks. Everything is done, and most donor advised funds certainly uh, the ones that are uh, part of either commercial institutions or large uh, community uh, or federations have websites so that you it makes it incredibly organized to track your charitable giving. And all of this really enables the funder to have a lot more time to be engaged with their charities and with their volunteerism. Um, as I said before, many donor advised funds will offer you a website, a secure website. You get your password, you log in, you can literally see all the money that's in there, history of your past giving, you can make your grants. Uh, some of these websites will allow you to see your investments and monitor that as well. If you're considering a donor advised fund, uh, it is very important to ask the question if they offer you a website uh, because this is one of the things that can really make a huge change in the efficiency of your charitable giving. This is just a little snapshot of our particular um, private site for our donors. Donor advised funds make your giving very efficient. Most important is the opportunity to put money aside for charitable purposes when it's most advantageous. So what does that mean? In a year when you have appreciated securities, when you have a bonus, you might have sale of a property, an inheritance, any unusual uh, amount of income in a particular year, uh, you have the opportunity now to set it aside Take the tax deduction in the year that you uh, make in the year that you make the contribution to a donor advised fund. You're not paying any capital gains on these appreciated securities, and you're getting that significant tax deduction while you still have a flexibility to give out to charities on your own timetable. So there's probably no more flexible way to set aside money.
donors to uh, people who use the donor advised fund don't have the 5% annual minimum distribution requirement that you would have in a private foundation. So it enhances the flexibility of the timetable for distributing to your charities. And from our point here, we see the full range of giving. There are people who literally put money in and give out 90% of the funds in the same year they put them in. And then there are people who are working towards large giving projects and maybe making distributions at 1 or 2 percent in a particular year, or skipping a year, aggregating money, and making large contributions to fund specific projects. But you can really implement your own strategy to achieve your philanthropic goals because you have this flexibility. The other huge factor in terms of people trending towards the donor advised fund is confidentiality. Um, not only do donor advised funds allow you to make grants anonymously if you choose to, uh, DAFs report their grant making in the aggregate. So we're never disclosing information about any individual donor. Um, this is pretty unique because if you have a private foundation, you're filing a 990 PF. It's very accessible online. People see how much money you have in it, how much money uh, you put in, where did you give your grants. So for people who are looking for a little bit more confidentiality, uh, the Donor Advice Fund offers a huge advantage. Um, another great thing about Donor Advice Fund is once the money is in your fund, most DAFs will allow you to invest it. There will be various investment options. You will earn tax-free income that's rebalanced into your fund. Uh, and that way you can have growth in your fund. Um, if you go with commercial donor advice funds, there may be more limitations to the investment options that are offered because they are also selling financial services. Independent donor advised funds tend to offer uh, a wider and less biased range of investments. Um, usually you have an opportunity to make allocations several times a year. At JCF, people can reallocate up to four times a year. Uh, another thing that is offered through some donor advised funds, and this is also something to inquire about, is if they have a private client group. Uh, this is usually a group of uh, people who are putting much more substantial money aside for their philanthropy, and there may be um, a more varied and robust set of investment options at those levels. I started to speak a little bit about the comparing the donor advice fund and the private foundation. This is the most typical uh, choice I think that people are making, although there is a variety. People could do supporting organizations and charitable lead trusts or simply checkbook charity. Um, usually it comes down to a decision between the donor advice fund and the private foundation. Um, this chart, I think, really lays out nicely some of the differences. The donor advice fund, again, because it is supported by a full 501c3 public charity, does offer you higher deductions on both cash as well as the appreciated securities. Um, there are You don't have the required annual distributions. In the private foundation, you have the 5%. You don't have excise tax on the net investment income, where you do have uh, 1 to 2 percent on the private foundation. Uh, you're not filing returns. That's what the donor advice fund will do for you. Um, and the confidentiality, as I just spoke about before, is really protected in the donor advice fund because you, there's no individual filing. And, uh, even though the differentials are not huge, 50% uh, on cash as opposed to 30, once you get into more significant contributions, uh, that, will make, that will make a difference. Uh, 
one of the things that does still drive people, I think, to private foundations, though, is the ability to make grants directly to individuals. This is not something you can do in the donor advice fund, but it's still permissible in the uh, private foundation. You can also pay individual family members that may serve on the board of a private foundation, but you cannot do that in the donor advice fund. Another thing to consider when you're thinking about donor advice funds is the way it can be used not just to facilitate giving for an individual, but it's actually a very good vehicle for family giving. Uh, all donor advised funds do have a sort of general charitable fund, and they will allow multiple parties to participate. So you could easily put uh, grandma and grandpa and the, the kids and even the grandkids if they're over 18 can work together on a fund the way you would work together in a foundation. Uh, some of the funds, the donor advised funds within the Jewish community also offer life cycle funds, which is a very nice way to connect the Jewish values and giving even at another level. Um, some will offer, like JCF does, we have bar and bat mitzvah funds, wedding funds, memorial funds. Um, so life cycle funds are another offering that happens through donor advised funds. Um, and then next-gen funds are offered by some donor advised funds. Uh, at JCF, it's for people 30 and under. But this is a way, it's a very low threshold of entrance. For $1,800, people can open a fund for someone 30 or under and get them started independently in their own giving, really empower them. Uh, and I believe that there are a number of other um, Jewish donor advised funds through federations that will facilitate that as well. Uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of the um, large donor advised funds do have private client groups uh, that offer enhanced services that are more likely to mirror the way a private foundation would work, but without some of the administrative burden and fiduciary responsibility and uh, they also would have services to enhance that multi-generational engagement. So many assets can be accepted by a donor advised fund. It's not simply cash and the long-term appreciated securities. Most donor advised funds will take bonds, they'll take mutual funds, uh, all kinds of illiquid assets. Uh, we have often taken real estate, we've taken art, limited partnerships, S-corps. So you can be as creative with the donor advised fund as you would be with any other type of charitable vehicle. Um, obviously with the liquid assets, it's more on a case-by-case -case basis, but you, you can really use whatever asset is advantageous for your own giving, you know, based on how, what your advisors recommend. Grant making. I think there's a lot of misconceptions around grant making and, and your, your, the full range of ability to make grants with donor advised funds. Um, I often feel the question from people who have private foundations, well, won't you limit what organizations I can give to or is it just on your approved list? But the role of the donor advised fund is to make sure that the charity that you're recommending receive a grant is a 501c3 public charity that's qualified to receive it and is in good standing with the IRS, meaning they're filing their 990s and uh, nothing is out of order. Um, we are not making, a, a donor advised funds are not making a value decision or determination or limiting your giving. It really is the one-stop shop for all your grant making, whether you want to give to your local hospital and your alma mater and your synagogue. You really can do it all in one place. Um, most donor advised funds will process a grant in less than a week. Here it's usually in one to three days. 
you can choose to be identified on your grant, and many people really want the family name. It's there on the check and on the cover letter, but you always have that ability to go anonymous. Uh, so what can you use a donor advice fund for? You can pay synagogue dues. You can support an annual campaign. You can make general contributions, scholarship funds, capital campaigns pretty much any type of grant that does not involve an exchange of goods and services, that would be prohibited. So the tickets to the dinner, the golf outing, the auction, where there's a clear ex financial exchange of, of goods and services, that is not permitted. Um, you cannot make grants directly to individuals. That's another restriction. Uh, and Legally binding pledge agreements can be a problem, but uh, I know that most donor advised funds uh, very actively engage with donors who are making significant multi-year grants, major gifts um, that require a gift agreement. They are usually able to negotiate a, a gift agreement that's acceptable to the grantee organization and still complies with the legal requirements for the donor advised fund. Um, just quickly go over this again. The multi-generational giving piece, um, I think this is a great opportunity for families to engage. You don't have to set up the whole structure. Uh, of uh, a foundation in order to put multiple generations together and really facilitate some wonderful values-based conversations around giving and let people all connect to the fund. Um, one thing to consider and ask about with donor advised funds, because here I find that the policies vary greatly from fund to fund, is can the funds continue from generation to generation? At Jewish Communal Fund, we don't limit perpetuity on the funds, uh, but that's not the policy at all donor advised funds. Uh, so even if you use it in your lifetime for multi-generational giving, if you're looking at it in terms of legacy planning, it's very important to ask about their policy on succession. For example, at a New York Community Trust, a fund can be given to two generations. But after that, anything remaining in the fund would go into one of their common funds or field of interest funds. Um, some places, any residual money folds into the core endowment. So if your intention is to have it continue for many generations, you do want to clarify the policy on succession. A private client group, I'll just mention briefly. This is something, if you're really looking for an alternative to the private foundation, but that, that closely aligns with the way the foundation would work, uh, you might inquire whether the donor advice fund has a private client group. We have a private client group that um, offers a lot of enhanced services. Uh, there are many more investment options, investment options that might mirror more of what people would do in their private foundation. Uh, we have the ability to vet managers not on a platform. Uh, facilitation of international grant making, particularly in Israel. I mean, we are very lucky because we partner with Jewish Funders Network in the Israel office, so we have a really enhanced ability to give in Israel. Um, but the international giving has become such an important part of giving for everyone, and particularly next generation. These are important questions and considerations when you're looking at donor advised funds to see, at least at the, the higher level, will they offer them. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'd like to turn it over to Scott and um, let him say a few things about how it is from the donor side and how he uses his donor advice fund here. Sure. Am I am I live? You are live, Scott. We okay, hear you. you can hear me. Good. Okay. Good. Um, first of all, I want to say that I've been a um, I've had an account at the Jewish Communal Fund for 
really many years since uh, dating back um, really uh, almost 30 years. And it was very useful when I was at Solomon Brothers, at, you know, when, when our compensation was essentially bonus-related. Um, and it was a great way of balancing, particularly on Wall Street, you know, good years and not such good years and less good years, as it were, um, and being able to maintain charitable contributions um, at a certain level and be a consistent giver. Um, notwithstanding, um, you know, what might happen in a particular year on Wall Street. Um, and at that time, it really wasn't even an issue for me to potentially utilize a foundation. Um, over time, thank God, um, uh, uh, you know, my uh, ability to contribute has grown. And with that, um, the flexibility that I've enjoyed as a donor um, of Jewish Communal Fund has grown as well. I mean, it's really obviated the need for creating a foundation um, uh, because the flexibility is pretty great. Um, the ability to make designations to subsequent generations to make even relatively complicated um, uh, um, um, notations to coming generations and how funds are to be decided jointly, which is... Uh, what Susan and I have uh, decided to do. So uh, um, any funds left over um, would be, have to be jointly decided uh, by our children. Um, and uh, that's the sort of flexibility that one would normally find in a foundation. Um, I love the ease of not having to worry about a, um, a tax filing, not having to worry about compliance, not having to worry about uh, accounting, um, the website and the ability to designate and even do due diligence on charities from the website is pretty good and is really um, uh, much easier than uh, writing a check or using a credit card or even having some sort of control procedure um, within a foundation. So. It really, um, really makes it much easier to actually make that donation um, and to do it in, you know, very little time. And regranting, particular, is, is even easier. Um, in terms of when have there been bumps on the road, um, occasionally, and on a rare occasion when you know we've been moved to by, uh, you know. Um, uh, an appeal for uh, for a family that uh, you know was God was was uh, sadly impacted by a terrorist attack or the like. There isn't the ability to give money to individuals, and so in that way, um, um, you know there are usually in all candor um, benevolent funds that focus on those sorts of things, and one can make donations to those benevolent funds in a general way of course, not designated to any specific individual, but for those who can and where someone is compelled and just feels the need to write a check, one just needs to write a check um, and not necessarily look at, um, look, you know, look at uh, the tax issue um, and just recognize that, uh, you know, that that's not available, that uh, the tax benefit isn't available. But for 99.9% .9 of um, our giving, the Jewish Communal Fund is um, extraordinarily flexible, useful, easy, um, and um, makes charitable giving um, uh, really, and administ administratively at least, uh, the pleasure that it is um, spiritually and otherwise. And the other thing I'm here to do is to answer any questions um, that anyone might have. I'm going to unmute everyone's lines. Um, we already had one question while Ellen was giving her presentation, which was about a, a very early slide um, okay. about um, does the 300000 to the community include discretionary grants only? Is it separate from donor advised fund grants? Those are the donor advised fund grants. So almost all our grant making, because we're not situated 
inside of a Jewish community foundation. We do not have a foundation structure. We don't have program officers. We don't have an RFP process. All those grants that you see, the thousands of grants, tens of thousands of grants we make each year, and the 300 million, that's on behalf of our donors. That's what we facilitate. And then from our, our profit, so to speak, uh, the, the fees that we're generating, the surplus that's thrown off, that $2 million, goes as an unrestricted grant to the Federation here in New York. And then in addition, the trustees from this special gifts fund are able to do other, uh, support other projects, usually capital projects that we feel will have a very high impact in the community. Fantastic. Thank you, Ellen. Do we have any other questions? I see Lauren. Lauren, you have your hand raised, but either hi. Speak. Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Yes. I yes. couldn't. I couldn't do it online for some reason. Um, okay. What, but earlier on, you had said that a, fo a private foundation can give money to an individual. What, what does that mean? You then uh, went on to say that obviously if someone's on the board, you could pay their salary. But what was what did you mean by the first comment? So there's different ways you can pay a, an individual. So for instance, some foundations, whether they're legally structured as an operating foundation or not, may in fact uh, give scholarships. They may say you fill out these essays every year and you send it in to the XYZ Foundation and we pick the scholarship winners, they are not giving scholarships to a school or an institution, they're handing a check to an individual student. That is permissible in a private foundation, that is not permissible from a donor advised fund. The donor advised fund would have to select uh, a particular college, university, private school, day school, and say, I would like to set aside X amount each year that I will give you from my donor advised fund. They could provide criteria of the type of students they would want to receive the scholarship money. But a donor advised fund does not have the ability to hand that check to an individual student. That's an example. So what I was referring to was something different. For example, in the, in the most recent terrorist attacks in Israel, there have been some children who have been left as orphans. And there have been people who have tried to organize efforts to support those orphans, some of them, sadly, very, very young. And that's direct personal support for people. And um, that's also not permitted. Um, that's not directly permitted. Correct. And, you know, there are other ways to do that, but not through the Jewish Communal Fund. So another question, are Jewish Communal Fund donors only based in New York? Do you have donors elsewhere in the nation? We have donors all over the world. Um, and it really comes from two facts. First, we were one of the first. I mean, we're around a long time at this point. And uh, by not limiting succession, so on some funds, we're in the third generation already, and families spread out. People make aliyah. Uh, people move across the country. I mean, we have donors in Israel. We have donors in Canada and all over the U.S. Okay. If we don't have any other questions, um, I think we can sign off. Oh, wait. Just kidding. There's another one. Are you concerned <laughs> about <laughs> – no, this is great. It's fantastic. Are you concerned about proposals in Washington to require donor advised fund payouts? How do you communicate that with donors? Um, I think we have some concerns. I mean, we pay out at a very high – average even compared to other donor advised funds, we're distributing every year almost 25% of total assets under management, which is pretty huge. Um, and I, I'd say donor advised funds, all of them aggregated together, 
they're still paying out pretty close to 20%, if not more. And if you remove the two top private foundations, if you take out Gates and Buffett, I do believe that the aggregated average for private foundation giving is closer to 12 or 13 percent. So donor advised funds are still being extremely effective in terms of pumping out money into the charitable stream each year compared to other vehicles. Um, that said, it's hard to know what will go on in Washington and what they will push for. Uh, I don't think we're going to see anything immediately, certainly not uh, until after the election. Um, and I think most of the communication that's happening now is on the sort of professional and association level between donor advised funds and within the professional philanthropic community, not as much communication between us and specifically with the individual donors. Uh, in terms of activity on a fund, though, I will say each donor advised fund varies. We are just looking at our policies now to make sure that we have policies that strike the right balance between giving people a lot of flexibility in their giving, in their, their spending, um, and that timetable, but also recognizing our role to actively facilitate and promote charitable giving, because that's the point. We want people to support charities. We want it to be easy and quick, and we want them to get the money out there to their charities. So. Um, Jewish Communal Fund does have a requirement. We ask that there's some grant activity uh, from each individual account at least every three years. Um, but I think there's a, a wide variation in terms of the policies depending on each donor advised fund. They do not all require that. Fantastic. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you everyone on the call for your thoughtful questions. These are going to be a great resource to folks at the JCF and at JFN because this is going to be posted to our website. So I'll be sending this out um, later today or tomorrow. So if we, if we don't have any additional questions, um, we're just going to close this out with many thanks to Ellen and to Scott for sharing your experiences and your expertise on this. This is incredibly important um, and a great way for us to be able to better support uh, the Jewish community. So thank you all for your time. And uh, I hope to speak with you and see you all soon. Have a great afternoon, Thank everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.